Data East was responsible for so many amazing games that I thought it would be fun to put together a list of the seven games that I believe everyone should play at least once. Now this is a list of games that Data East developed. There are some really great Data East games that they published, like Override for PC Engine, but games that they published won't be included here, so please keep that in mind. Data East, sometimes referred to as Deco, was started in Japan in 1976. They unfortunately went bankrupt in 2007, but their legacy lives on with iconic games that are still being enjoyed today. So let's cut to it. Burger time! Burger Time came out in 1982 and it's an arcade classic. You play as Chef Peter Pepper and it is your duty to make gigantic hamburgers. You need to walk across the ingredients while trying to flee from eggs and weenie wigglers. It's super satisfying when you walk across a bun, burger patty, or a piece of lettuce all at once and watch it crush an enemy. DIE! Besides dodging, you can also blast your enemy with pepper, but be careful because you only are given four handfuls for the entire game. That's right, you don't get replenished until it's a game over, so that's kind of brutal. It's not an easy game, but every once in a while an ice cream cone or a cup of coffee will appear that gives you bonus points. But don't dawdle because it disappears rather quickly. As the stages progress, new ingredients are added as well as new enemies. I especially like the little pickle chips in level 3. Probably one of the main reasons I enjoy this game is due to the cute characters and food theme. Even though it can get pretty tough, it's still fun to pick up and play every now and again. This was released on the NES, as well as many other platforms over time, so there's a high chance you encountered it at some point. A few years ago, I hated the NES port, but playing it again I'm not sure why because I find it just fine. Real Ghostbusters most people remember the NES version of Ghostbusters, but the arcade game called The Real Ghostbusters was actually a lot cooler. It was based off the cartoon of the same name. The reason why they had to add the word real to the title was because there was another show from the 70s called Ghostbusters and another cartoon called Ghostbusters. So they needed to differentiate between them. Unlike the shitty NES game, this game does what you'd actually want to be doing in a Ghostbusters game. You're zapping ghosts, and that's it. And don't let the funny walk cycle of your character fool you. It's great. This did come out three years after the NES game, so maybe they learned what not to do by then. The designers had a chance to be really creative, and it shows. There are a lot of different ghosts, which adds to the fun factor. Level 3 has my favorite batch of ghouls, and the mummies look like a bunch of silver surfers walking around, which I find amusing. There are beam power-ups which you can obtain that really help out, but be careful, you lose them if you die. There are bridges to walk across which can be kind of hard to make out if it's your first time playing, and the proton packs make an ear-piercing noise, which sucks, but overall it's a fun game that I recommend trying out. This was ported to the C64, ZX Spectrum, and other computers, but for some reason it never received a console port, which is a shame. I could have easily seen this being a Genesis title. Tumble Pop. We have two Ghostbusters games on this list. Well, sort of. Tumble Pop involves a few characters that run around stages sucking up ghosts and monsters with vacuum type devices and then they spit them back out. I wonder if this is where they got the idea for Luigi's Mansion. The projectiles that are shot out can be used to damage other enemies. You can only fit a few monsters in the vacuum at a time too many and it will explode. Similar to Mr. Do or Bubble Bobble, as you go through the levels you collect letters that will spell out the word Tumble Pop, which takes you to a bonus stage. I found it a very easy game to pick up and play. You can grasp what you have to do almost immediately so there really isn't a learning curve. There are bosses in the game and they are fought the same way as everything else in the game. So there isn't a lot of depth to the gameplay, but that doesn't really bother me. It may not be the most interesting game in the world, but I find it very addicting. I'd rather play this than Karnov, if nothing else. Bad Dudes Bad Dudes vs. Dragon Ninja, or more commonly called Bad Dudes, is an iconic game that you either encountered in the arcade or at home on your NES. I personally can't stand the NES version, and I prefer the arcade version. 
The game opens with a simple but totally awesome plot. President, President Ronnie, was kidnapped by ninjas and it's up to you to save him. Well, if you're a bad enough dude, that is. The game asks possibly the most infamous question in retro gaming history. Are you a bad enough dude to save the president? Well, you better be. Because right away you need to kick the shit out of ninjas and chicks that look like they want to fight you in a dance-off. It's your classic side-scrolling beat-em-up that you can play either by yourself or with another bad dude. The jumping reminds me of Contra or Shinobi, and you use punches and kicks to defend yourself. The further away you are, you punch, but if you're close to an enemy, you kick. I found the spin kick to be the most helpful. You get power-ups that are food items, like a can of coke. To keep things changing up, you can pick up different weapons along the way, like daggers and nunchucks. New weapons keep things fun. In the arcade version of the game, you gotta pay attention to the signs in the background. One in the beginning references the Deco Cassette system, which was the first standardized arcade system that allowed owners to change games. Then another sign advertises Karnov, which I thought was pretty funny, considering a dude that looks an awful lot like Karnov is the first boss. Then, in the second level, Data East advertises themselves on the train. I thought that was cute. I wonder why more games don't do this. They could easily advertise other games this way. Plus, it's just a fun thing to keep an eye out for. It makes me think of games like the Ninja Turtles arcade game, where you're seeing advertisements for Pizza Hut all over the place. I'm into it. Windjammers Windjammers is a Neo Geo game released in 1994, and it's one of the few sports games that I really enjoy. You can also now get it on PS4 or the Switch. Visually, it's about as 90s as you can get. Insanely bright colors with a heavy emphasis on neon, bike shorts with visors, and sick shades. I absolutely love the vibe. If I could visit a game world, I'd love to visit the beach from this game. You can choose from six different characters and they are ranked based on skill level. I tend to stick with the beginner characters because although I really like this game, it tends to kick my ass. You and an opponent throw a frisbee, or should I say disc? I guess disc sounds less lame. Anyway, you throw a disc back and forth trying to score a point on your opponent, or try to catch the disc before it lands in your goal zone. Playing this game versus another person is a super competitive experience. And that is where the game has legs because you can play this game back and forth forever. Kind of like with fighting games, challenging each other just doesn't get old. The gameplay looks simple, but it actually has a lot more to it than you'd think. You can throw the disc a number of ways, and it takes some getting used to. You can throw it straight, do a little zigzag maneuver, throw it up in the air, or do this crazy spinny thing. All in all, it's a fun game to play on your own or with a friend, and a great way to escape to a 90s tropical paradise. Magical Drop 3 If you're a fan of Poyo Pop, Puzzle Bobble, or Dr. Robotnik's Mean Bean Machine, you'll probably like Magical Drop. In this game, colorful bubbles drop from the top of the screen and you have to match them up by connecting three or more of the same color. The graphics are really colorful and appealing to look at. And there's a whole bunch of oddball characters to choose from which helps create the game's dreamy, cute anime aesthetic. It seems like they always throw goofy characters into these kinds of games, maybe to make up for the lack of story. And it works! There is versus mode, adventure mode, and puzzle mode. The single player mode is fine, but I find that this game is the most fun when you're playing another person. The music in Magical Drop 3 makes you panic more than the previous games, which is an improvement because it's supposed to make you feel that way. Gameplay wise, there are some minor differences between the third game and the previous ones. It adds a third button for grabbing rows of balloons. There were all sorts of console ports of the games from the series, but I think most people know this as a Neo Geo game. If you want intense, head-to-head -head puzzle combat with a friend, then this is a game you should totally check out. Joe and Mac Throughout history, there have been a lot of iconic duos. Mario and Luigi, Bonnie and Clyde, Tia and Tamara. But let's not forget about those crazy cavemen, Joe and Mac. Not to be confused with Mick and Mac. Joe and Mac, or Caveman Ninja, is a bright and colorful platformer that was first released in 1991 in the arcade. It was soon after adapted to a ton of different platforms. I personally prefer the SNES port, as I find the NES one barely playable. 
Oh, and it's also available on Zebo if that's your thing. You play as Joe, who has green hair, and Mac, who has blue hair, and you use your caveman ninja abilities to save all kinds of bright-haired ladies from bad guys. The levels are appropriately prehistoric, as there are plenty of dinosaurs and weapons like bones, boomerangs, wheels, and clubs. Throwing bones is my favorite way to kill enemies, because it gives you a lot of distance. You can use the weapons in almost every direction, which is awesome when it comes to hitting enemies flying over your head. I really like the pacing of this game. The levels are rather short, and there's a boss at the end of each stage, which is fun. Each boss is unique and creative. I feel bad for the woolly mammoth who you hit until his trunk falls off. That's pretty brutal. And like with any good game, you get powered up by eating meat you randomly find laying around. So I guess I'd call this sky meat, land meat? I don't know, but it's cute. I can see why some people complain that the game moves a bit slow and the jumps are kind of sluggish, but it's easy to get used to and I honestly don't think it's a problem, especially if you utilize the spin jump. Once you get a hang of that, it will make your life a lot easier. Every time I play this game, I can't get over how beautiful the graphics look and how awesome the sprite designs are. It's like many other side-scrolling platformers, but it's nice that you can play co-op and it's super well done. It's certainly a lot more fun than caveman games, so if you're looking for some prehistoric playtime, here's your answer. There was a follow-up called Joe and Mac 2, Lost in the Tropics. This time, instead of saving chicks from your tribe, a guy named Gork comes and takes your precious crown so you gotta get it back. When it comes to the gameplay, things move a lot faster in this game. The first thing I noticed is there is more variety when it comes to enemies, and the rival cavemen do a funny beat-up animation if they attack you. Your weapon upgrade comes from eating different kinds of fruit, so you'll be switching up weapons more often, which is fun. And finally, we have Congo's Caper, which is part of the Joe and Mac franchise, even though it doesn't have Joe and Mac in the title. It makes it weird and confusing, but whatever. It's pretty similar to the other games, except everything seems a lot more cutesy. And instead of playing as Joe or Mac, you play as a boy who can also turn into a monkey, because why not? The enemies and level design are similar, so it does still feel like Joe and Mac. I prefer the other two games, but this one is fun and I could see myself getting into it if I dedicated more time to it. So those are my top picks for games developed by Data East. But before we go, I'd like to leave you with some honorable mentions. Boogie Wings is a very unique, action-packed arcade game that I just cannot get the hang of if my life depended on it. However, it is still fun to play every now and again and I know people who absolutely love it. So give it a try. Karnov is a beloved arcade game that also has a lot of fans when it comes to its NES port. I really tried to like this game, but I just could not deal with the item select. I don't know, it's iconic, but it's just not for me. I'm mentioning it because I know some of you will be totally mad at me if I don't. And lastly, we have Midnight Resistance. Yes, it's heavily inspired by Contra, but if you like Contra, then this is worth trying out. I think it's fun. Are your favorite Data East games not on the list? If so, let me know what they are in the comments, and thank you so much for watching, and I'll be back again very soon. Please be sure to tap the little bell icon so you can be notified every time I post a new video if you don't want to miss out.